Okay, everybody. Why are we here? You got an A. I'm Bob Wilson. I am the immediate past chair of the Board of Trustees of the Capital Center for the Arts. And you actually gave the wrong answer. We're here because we're in Marty's house. He lived here. He still lives here. As a matter of fact, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to have just a very brief conversation with Marty. Hey, Marty, there are a lot of people out here. You know what it is in Italian. You talk with your hands, right? Well, there are a lot of people here because you are here. And we're going to have a party because of you, and we're happy for that. So, some, some of the people, people there are two, two people, people who are, are not here. here. I'm really sort of subbing for David Fries, who, like you, is very tall and looks out over crowds. And that's an advantage that you had when you were directing the traffic out there in Governor's Hall. And the other person who's not here, well, I should say why David isn't here. He's here, he's not here because he's visiting his parents. And he called me a couple of days ago and he said, you know, I have to make a decision. Should I go meet my parents because it's our, I haven't seen them for a couple of months, or should I be there for Marty's celebration? I said, you go see your parents because you can. And the other person who's not here is Nikki Clark. And you know, Marty, why she's not here because she's in New York City. Uh, she's having a good time, I hope, but she's also getting the roster ready for the shows for 2014, 2015. And I know that you want her in New York doing that because you want the show to go on. So Marty, we're just thrilled to be here on your behalf, and we're gonna have one heck of a good time because we're in your house, we're gonna take good care of it, and we want to honor you with everything we've got, and we've got a lot, including two people named Nick and Cammie. Hi, everyone. Oh, welcome. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I am uh, not Kid A. I'm Kid 2. Cammie's Kid A. We tried it the other way. I tried being uh, Kid B. Nah. Nobody liked it. Nobody liked it. So, um, Cammie, you should start by Nick talking. Nick got really jealous when I was Kid number one. Yeah, so, wasn't good. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for coming. It's amazing to see so many old friends. I just, um, it's fantastic. And, uh, Everyone keeps asking me if I'm sad, and I am sad, of course, but I'm also so happy to see everybody. It's just wonderful. I'm so glad you all were able to be here. So um, as Kid A, I have a bit of a type A personality, and I like lists. So I decided to make a list for today um, of things that I learned from my dad. And... Um, some of these things are things that I actually learned. Some of these things are things I aspire to. But um, somehow this list ended up with something like 18 items, which is not very round, but we're going to go with it anyway. Uh, the first one is, and this is an inside joke between me and Dad, when you make a fist, your thumb should be on the outside of your fingers, not on the inside. That's how you break your thumb, apparently. Uh, my dad taught me how to make bread, as you, uh, many of you probably know, of all kinds. No need, potato rolls, lemon poppy seed, and of course, the ever famous oatmeal molasses bread. One of dad's favorite things was uh, number three, never fly when you can drive. <laughs> number four, on a related note, your car can double as a hotel room in a pinch <laughs> or a storage closet. Number five, being a good dancer is a matter of enthusiasm, not talent. <laughs> Number six, it's never too late to become a liberal. <laughs> Number seven, weekends are for canoeing, biking, camping, hiking, reading, board games, and gatherings with friends. 
Number eight, on a related note, cleanliness is overrated. <laughs> Number nine, on a related note, going to church is overrated. <laughs> Number 10, ask questions and listen. Number 11, everyone is a close friend until proven otherwise. Number 12, you can always change your life, even if you're an unemployed single father of two. Number 13, you can still have a great life, even if you're an unemployed single father of two. <laughs> Number 14, life is for living. Number 15, you don't need a Nintendo to have fun. Anything can be a toy, socks, tennis balls, meat skewers, and especially answering machines. <laughs> and number 16, these are two things that are better summed up in the words of others, but they are definitely life lessons from my dad. The first is all you need is, is love, and the second is only the good die young. Thanks, Cam. Thank you, Cammie. I, uh, I'm, I, it's, ble it's like a blessing and a curse. I've lived my 34 years, and I've never really lost anybody close to me in those years. And so my whole life, I would you know, dream about, God, well, the big one, your dad. I mean, what am I going to do when that happens? He's like so big, and I thought, and I thought, and I would think about it as a child, a macabre sensibility maybe, but uh, we've all done that at some point. But anyway, uh, so I thought about it, and I thought about it, and it, um, what I wanted to say came down to this sentence, basically, which is, uh, in a too small car packed with rotten fruit, the most important man in my life made a family, and he made a choice. Uh, what I decided I need to do is to distill all of the great things that Marty did and that he taught the two of us into, like, what's the most important lesson? Uh, and specifically because I have just, uh, my lovely wife Brenda and I have just had a kid, Marty, who's right over there. Uh, I don't know if he can stand up. He's really cute. <laughs> Somebody said I didn't even need to do a speech. I could just do, like, the Lion King thing, and I thought about it. But I hated the Lion King uh, so badly. And Dad did, too. He was never fond of the later Disney films. Um, Dad never, you know, if, if he thought something wasn't very good, he, he, would make, he would tell you, you know. He would let you know. And I love that about him. We were going to praise this man today, but he could be ruthless at times, you know, with his, with his, with his thoughts. Um, and that's why this, I had to thinking of the story of Jehovah's Witnesses coming to his house and him talking to them for four hours and the fact that I don't think a single week, week went by where we did not go to somebody's house and spend the night, I think, for our entire youth. Um, he's, you know, you don't stay at home and hang out and watch TV. You have to go out into the world and do things every single day. And I thought and I thought and I thought about this one meaningless at the time story, which was a pizza delivery man. Uh, from Mug Pizza in Penacook, New Hampshire. He came and delivered our Hawaiian pizza. And he was wearing this like, grotesque heavy metal shirt, you know, with a skull and a naked woman on the front. And he was a little drunk. Uh, and Dad, you know, and I was worried Dad would say something. Or Dad paid the guy, and then he looked at him, and he's like, I like your shirt. <laughs> and the pizza delivery man stayed there for an hour. And this is true. And he stayed there for an hour and he talked. And I was sitting at the kitchen table just waiting to wonder what this man was talking about. And he was talking about a heavy metal show he went to where there was a drum on a drum kit that was spinning on two different axes and flame was coming out of the side <laughs> while this song was going. And Dad had no idea what the guy was talking about. <laughs> and Dad, and all he was doing was looking at him with rapt attention. I'm like, yeah. God, that would have been cool. <laughs> and I still, now, so many years later, you know, I think I enjoy dreaming about that drum, you know, the flame coming out of the side, <laughs> spinning on its axes. Uh, and it, comes, it came down to this, uh, which is you um, have a choice. You can choose to love all the people in this world and have a great time or not. And that's regardless of where you start and what you have, how much money's in your pocket, or what kind of car you have. Uh, and so in a too small car that was packed with rotten fruit and cheese and us and Trivial Pursuit, the most important man in my life made a family, uh, and it's all of us here. So thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Tom Sheldon. I was one of Marty's doctors, but I'll certainly always be one of his friends. Um, when Arnie asked me to come and play today, uh, I immediately knew what I wanted to do. I said, of course, I'm going to play some Bach. I play the oboe. I've done it for decades now. And, you know, I wanted to start with something that was moving and flowing and, you know, get everybody in the mood, almost like you're drifting down a river, and then move to something in a minor key, something sad that could really evoke, you know, some of the sadness we might feel, and then finally begin end with maybe a dance movement, something that would really bring us up. And, you know, Bach is so beautiful that, that it would serve two things. One, it would bring out this emotion, and everybody would say, wow, that Tom can really play, because Bach is so beautiful anyway. <laughs> and I said to myself, this isn't about Tom, and this isn't about something so conventional. With Marty, you have to think outside of the box. And so I thought very hard. I've been studying for years and learned to play this accursed thing. And, and one of the things I wanted to think about was, how can I depict Marty? You know, music is abstract. Uh, but certainly, if you think about a master like Beethoven, he could um, have play a pastoral symphony, and you're in a high meadow or in a in a river basin, uh, beautiful fertile pasture. You know, you can you can evoke these things. So, can I take it a step further? Can I come up with a piece that really depicts a person? And it's a little chancy, I understand, but if there if if it isn't doesn't work for this group, it's not going to work for anyone. So what I'd like to play first is a movement from Benjamin Britten's uh, Metamorphoses. Uh, it's only short, it's about two and a half minutes. And I think, to me, it evokes Marty's personality and his spirit so much. Um, I hope you all enjoy it, and uh, if you don't, if you can't hear Marty in it, at least enjoy the music. Thank you. So, Marty certainly gives us all the opportunity to step out of the box. And once I was out of it, I said, okay, what else can I do? Um, and um, so I'm going to do something, even I think in a way musically, a little chance here. When we lose somebody, we feel their spirit. You know, Marty was not about the concrete notions of spirituality, but 
Um, we certainly feel his energy, we feel his spirit, and whether it's in us or out of us, we don't know, it doesn't matter, he's here. Um, so what I thought I would do is try to find a piece of music that could kind of depict spirit, and maybe Marty's spirit. Um, what I thought about was how a spirit, you know, begins in a very lyrical way, um, you know, how it's around us and, and floating, um, and it's energy. And the physicist in me uh, always says that, well, energy has to change, has to in some ways dissipate. You know, heat gets cold, but other energy, uh, entropy really takes effect. And as energy changes and dissipates, it becomes chaotic, it becomes become more dissonant. So we might start with a lyrical kind of feel, become more in some ways stronger and more dissonant, and then kind of float away. So again, you know, I think this is really out of the box. I hope people can you know, consider Marty's spirit and think about spirituality uh, in this little piece. Uh, this is again by Benjamin Britten. Uh, this was written in 1951, I think, so Marty would have been, what, about nine years old at that time. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, everyone, to Marty. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Strzok. <laughs> but seriously, I also answer to Gail Kinney. Um, Arnie and I go way back to the um, mid-1980s, and uh, so I go back with Marty to the point that he waltzed into Arnie's life. And I just remember really quickly, it was before I saw Marty and Arnie together, it was uh, Mary Lou Sayer, who's um, a part of the family, who said to me, you should see this guy. He is just perfect with Arnie. So... <laughs> Um, that was wonderful. What, part of what we wanted to do today is that we wanted to capture a little bit of Marty's youth. And so Steve Strzok and Marty go way back, they're childhood friends, and whether they were young or whether they got older, when they got together, they were still just two boys at play. And unfortunately, Steve um, was not feeling well, was not able to travel to be with us today, but 
just about the time that we discovered that, Arnie received a letter from one of Marty's army buddies. Now, this is a part of Marty that um, most of us didn't know about, but Marty was in the army in the mid-60s and actually served in Vietnam and with his army buddy, Bob Most. And so, just as we were discovering that Steve couldn't be here, Arnie got a three-page letter from Bob Most, Marty's army buddy, and very, very thoughtful. So we decided to give you just a sense still of two boys at play. I want to read you the story from Bob Most. Arnie, I'm not able to attend on January 12th. Um, Bob is in New Jersey. But I've been thinking about what I could say about Marty. This isn't difficult at all. Marty and I first met in January 1966 in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where we were both assigned to work in the administration offices of the 16th Artillery Battalion. Marty was made secretary to the chief warrant officer who ran the logistical operations of our battalion, and I was on the financial side of the unit. Even in war, soldiers need to get paid on schedule. Very quickly, we became friends and worked our way out of the barracks and into a private room. It had been the mail room and was available. I wasn't crazy about it, but Marty saw the potential and convinced me it would be a great place to have a private room. <laughs> what a combination, me, a neat freak, and Marty. <laughs> if you knew Marty, neat was not a word in his vocabulary. His desk looked like a grenade had been tossed onto it at all times. He drove both the warrant officer and the sergeant crazy. No matter how many times they told him to straighten his desk, it never seemed to work. He'd organize it, and then he could never find the paperwork they wanted. Yet when the desk looked like a tornado had come through, he could find anything they wanted in seconds. I never could figure out how he did that. Nevertheless, we were great roommates and great friends because we both never took all the military stuff too seriously. We were both college grads, and our officers weren't much older than ourselves and just out of college also. But what a room. Until an inspection was coming, you could not find Marty's bed. <laughs> he would always find something else to put in the room. Once we got three-day passes and drove to my house in Long Island, New York, all very illegal, but so what, says Marty. We came back with this huge television my parents were throwing out. It barely made it into the back seat of the car. We hardly had space for it in the room, and we never thought about what we were going to do for an antenna, but Marty saw potential in that TV. We, <laughs> we'd have our own television. Since they wouldn't allow us to string up our own antenna, we took turns propping up the rabbit ears and we watched TV, or tried to, through the snow on the screen. Another time, we drove up to my house in a blizzard. In Virginia, I lost control of the car, and down the embankment in the middle of the highway we went. All you could see was white. Everyone in the car was asleep, and one of the guys woke up and so seriously asked, are we in heaven? A huge Department of Transportation plow stopped, and since we were soldiers, they just yanked us back onto the highway. By now, I was catatonic, so Marty volunteered to drive. Within five miles, he hit black ice, and we were now going down the highway sideways, <laughs> headed right for the guardrail. We stopped about a foot from it. So we started to drive again, and soon we see a sign welcoming us to Virginia. But that wasn't right. We'd seen a sign about an hour before that saying, you are now leaving Virginia. <laughs> In the storm, Marty had missed the turnoff, and we had been circling DC. <laughs> that trip took us all night and half the next day to get to my house. All we did was go to bed and then wake up the next day and drive back to Fort Bragg. Then there was a time we decided to drive to Marty's house in Bloomington. Marty had an uncanny way of meeting people everywhere or running into people he knew in the most unlikely of places. 
He'd met a bunch of college girls from Huntington, West Virginia when we were at Myrtle Beach one time. They insisted that if we were ever in the area that we visit them. So on our trip to Marty's house, we purposely drove through West Virginia and had free room and board for a night. Marty was a traveling man. <laughs> Eventually, we made it over to Vietnam. We had our same jobs as in the States, plus doing guard duty at night and tending to the howitzers. We settled out in the boonies on a mountain nicknamed Cherry Hill. Our mission was to provide protection for a marine air base in Chu Lai, which was 55 miles south of Da Nang. After some time, you were eligible for rest and recuperation, so Marty, with a twinkle in his eye, decides to go to Singapore, and he asked me to go along. I thought about Marty, and I said, no, I don't think so. But that didn't stop Marty. Off he goes to another place in the world. A week later, Marty shows up so proud of his new purchase. While in Singapore, he had a hand-tailored silk suit made for himself. So here we are in Vietnam, but Marty had to model his silk suit for all of us. So it's a hot, humid country with lots of rain and mud, and Marty's wearing a new silk suit. So I said to him, Marty, where are you going to wear this around here? And he just looked at me. And it reminded me of when it suddenly dawned on us back in the States that we had that huge, huge TV and no way to really watch it. It was that Marty look of bedazzlement. But it didn't last long. He said, I'm going to wear this suit. I think he wore the suit when we got back to San Francisco after we were discharged and on our cross-country tour across the United States. We were discharged in Oakland, California, and Marty, as only Marty could do, had connections and a place for us in San Francisco. We had free board for a week, we had lots of back pay in our pockets, and we had another friend who'd gotten assigned to the Oakland area who had a car and was from New York. What more could we ask? A trip across the country with Marty was in the making. First, we hit Vegas, 1967. The lights, the dazzle, and the guy with us that played one last hand and ended up totally broke and had to have his parents wire him money so we could continue on our trip. On to Austin to see my sister for a few days, and then to Oklahoma, and we stayed at a chapter of Marty's college fraternity. Eventually, we made it to Marty's house. His mother and father were so happy to see him. I hated saying goodbye, and we promised to keep in touch. We did for a number of years, but as happens, our lives became busy. Marriage, kids, jobs, and we eventually lost contact. But about three years ago, I started coming to grips with my own mortality, and I decided to find several of my close army buddies. Somehow, I found a fellow who knew Marty from his dad's produce business, and I was, he was able to point me to New Hampshire. The first time I called and told Marty who I was calling, he instantaneously spouted off my army serial number. <laughs> who can do that? Marty, for sure. Well, at this point, Arnie, you know the story. I visited you in New Hampshire, and we spent an entire day and in late into the evening talking and reminiscing. It was as if 30 years had never been in between. So for the last few years, we stayed in touch. Occasionally, I'd check out your website. I'd call Marty. We'd plan to meet in Brooklyn to see Nick's band, The Flanks. While that never happened, someday, maybe we can all meet up. And just as an aside, before I close with the final, uh, his final, Bob Most's final words, Bob Most did keep in touch with Marty and with Arnie, and just happened, coincidentally, to call on November 1st, wanting to talk to Marty again, the day after Marty died. And Nick answered the phone, and Bob Most said it got him to thinking he went back into all the slides that they had taken in Vietnam and elsewhere in the Army from the 60s. And he's in the process now of putting together those old pictures that he's going to share with Arnie and everyone else who loved Marty. So Bob Most concludes with, while it's sad and I'll miss him, 
Even in his passing, Marty gave me some joy and happiness. It caused me to look back at our t the, a time in our lives that were full of fun and adventure. Somehow with Marty around, no matter what predicament we were in, it worked out. My life and so many others were enriched by knowing Marty Capodice. My sincerest regards, Bob Most, 